So a number of folks have offered the critique that the Democratic Party doesn't do enough for the Black community, given the community's longstanding loyalty. I mean, loyalty. What do you have to say about that? Let's start with you, um, Ebony. Um, thank you so much for that question. And first and foremost, I want to thank the California Democratic Party, thank the California Democratic Black Caucus, um, Taisha and your leadership, and just thank you for this invitation this evening. Um, we definitely have heard and we understand that there's definitely more that we need to do um, with the Democratic Party, but we have made some progress. Uh, we are moving in the right direction. And as we are working and as we are organizing, it's important that we stay connected. That's why, you know, working with leaders on the ground like Taisha is so important because they keep us connected to the pulse of the community. And when we think about progress, we currently have a Black man who is the head of the Democratic Party. And I am so, it is such an honor to work under Chairman uh, Jamie Harrison and his leadership. So as we are thinking to organize and work, it is coalition based, it is constituency based. And we understand that the Black community is one of the most, if not the most important constituency to our party. And we are consistent and we are voting and we are working to bring programming and messaging that is relevant to you. And also thank you for everything that everything that you do for a cycle after cycle. Um, how about Drexel? Well, first off, good evening, everyone, and hello from Los Angeles. Uh, I am glad to be here uh, with this great panel, uh, especially my friend and our newly elected assembly member from the Fighting 54th, Isaac Bryan. Uh, so thank you, uh, Vincent, and, and the entire staff for uh, putting on this panel tonight. Um, you know, I think that's a, a really good question. Um, the party, uh, has a long-standing history, uh, as Ebony um, kind of alluded to, of supporting policies focused uh, on the Black community, um, updating our platform to reflect uh, ever-changing times, and supporting Black candidates uh, and elected officials all across the country. Uh, I think, uh, personally, I, I have a, a little bit of issue with the term loyalty, uh, because uh, I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a party guy uh, who came from a military family. Uh, so I got into this business to help people. Uh, in a service first mentality uh, and our party's voters and supporters, um, you know, we hope are, are there because uh, we support progressive policies uh, and do the work uh, to reflect the future. Uh, so loyalty sometimes implies uh, a, a transactional piece uh, and politics uh, is transactional, uh, but service is not transactional and should not be transactional. Isaac. Oh, you're on mute. I'm first going to come off mute. Uh, <laughs> I agree. First of all, thank you all for having me. It's it's so great to be with you, and today's an incredibly special day for for the community, for the culture, for the country. Um, I agree with all of the comments before me, and, and I'm thinking about that transactional piece. and And service absolutely is not transactional, uh, but politics is, and the transaction has been an incredibly powerful and resounding black vote for 50 plus years. Uh, with, a, with a bedrock of black women in particular, who have flipped seats, who have won presidential elections for the party, for the country, who have carried us at times when we weren't strong enough to carry ourselves. And I think uh, the party has made tremendous strides and, and progress uh, that should be noted has been seen and has to be encouraged and uplifted, but we're not quite where we need to be yet, right? And some of the afterlives of slavery are still bipartisan, right? And there are things that we need to dismantle and the party uh, needs to continue to play a tremendous role in, in helping to dismantle those things and to put the right people in office to establish the right platform, but also hold elected officials and others accountable for enacting that platform uh, through policy making. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Um, I stand firm in the belief that uh, without Black people across this country, President Biden, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, Warnock, Senator Warnock and Ossoff would not be in office and our fine country would still be in turmoil. Uh, as a black woman, I stand firm and believe in, uh, I'm wet, waist deep in the Democratic Party. I live, eat and breathe the Democratic Party and I expect the party um, to listen when I, when I need to speak and say that something's wrong. I stand uh, as the leader of many black people. We have a tremendous amount of members that count on me speaking up. And so when I see something wrong, 
I will pick up the phone and call Rusty or I will make some noise to make sure that we're doing something to rectify it. Uh, I believe that we no longer can stand by being quiet when we think we are being devalued or disrespected. It, it's up to all of us on this call to stand up and call it out, call it what it is and uh, demand change. I see the change happening over the last three years. I've seen a lot of change and I'm holding people accountable and um, I'm not scared to do that. I think we all should hold our elected officials accountable and people that profess uh, to stand with black people, our allies. And a follow-up question for you, Thaisa, and for everyone else. Um, one critique, or one response to that critique that I know I've heard people say is that the black community, at least prior to the Black Lives Matter movement, did not have a clear, coherent set of demands. What do you feel about that, Taisha? I don't feel that that's true. I think that we had uh, demands in uh, different silos and different groups, and we all bring our, our demands uh, to different people. Now that had, we haven't collectively come together with the demands and set them right in the seat of, or in the arms or hands of, uh, of Joe Biden or Governor Newsom or whoever uh, the democratic leader is. Um, but we definitely have demands and I think we've demonstrated that. And for those that have not been paying attention, I will say, just look around you. You see uh, black people are the highest underemployed, uh, unemployed, homeless, health disparities, and, and so on and so forth. So it shouldn't take us necessarily laying it out there. It's clear. Our children, Black children, are suffering. And so those things are apparent to people. Um, and if they're, not, if they're not apparent, they should be. With our allies that are watching, they should know where the disparities are in the Black community. Some of Brian, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, th I think Ms. Brown makes a tremendous point. Right? We, we are not required to be a greater monolith than anybody else. We're allowed to have changing demands. We're allowed to be uh, dynamic and, and to have multiple thoughts and, and, and uh, actions that we need our policymakers on all level of government to respond to. When, when I hear that we haven't had any cohesive demands, though, I'm thinking Sheila Jackson Lee might have something to say about that. Right? There might be some folks who, who have some feelings about that, but we want the same thing that everybody wants. We want to own homes. Uh, we want our kids to be well educated. We want to be well educated. We don't want to live near environmental hazards, right? We want to make a living wage, a prevailing a wage. We want to work one job to provide for ourselves. Uh, we don't want to be discriminated against. We don't want to be killed by law enforcement, uh, unarmed, or any other kind of way. We don't want our brothers, sisters, uncles, aunties, nieces uh, incarcerated at a disproportionate rate or pushed out of schools. I mean, the, the things that we want in our community are the things that everybody in this country wants. Uh, we're just the ones who most often don't get them. Right? And, and we shouldn't have to better organize to make that clear. We've made it incredibly clear for 400 years now. Reach it. Um, Ebony? I mean, I disagree with what has been said before me. And when it comes to the Black community, as I said, we are not monolithic. When we think about how we organize, when we think about how we move, when we think about our existence in this country, it is not all in the, all in the same way. So when we think about how we organize, I will say I come from, before working for the DNC, I worked for the National Urban League. And we had community conversations. We had a cohesive plan. There were conversations that were happening across the board on behalf of the Black community. So there is an agenda. And the thing, as was stated before, we want equity in this country. We want full citizenship, full citizenship in this country, which we are due because we are citizens of this country. So the delivery might be different. The method might be different. But there is a cohesive message of equity, inclusion in the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness in this country that was told that we were, that we were, that we were afforded by the U.S. Constitution. Drexel? Um, obviously, I agree with what everyone, um, you know, ha has said here. I think, uh, you know, whoever has is cr out there cr uh, uh, critiquing that uh, doesn't doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, as, as Isaac and everyone has said, we have activists, elected officials and community leaders uh, who have been very clear about the direction that we want to see on various issues affecting our community, uh, whether it's on housing or climate justice or health care uh, or how law enforcement uh, affects our communities in general or whatever. Um, you know, they're, they're not clear to people because those folks just aren't listening. 
Uh, and that's not necessarily on us to provide uh, all that information. If they if they want a whole list, uh, you know, I think that's that's really what it comes down to. People want us to do more work so <laughs> that they can uh, uh, feel better about themselves. Uh, they want us to put it on paper for them and to hand it to them. Uh, that is not how uh, it should be working. And uh, but uh, you know, I think uh, it is it is always uh, a situation where we're being asked to do more for someone else uh, so that they can understand uh, that time is over. And it, it, uh, I always feel too, when people say that, it's almost like when people say um, people never, that the black community doesn't do enough about black on black crime. And I wanna say, have you been in the community? There have been so many like rallies and marches and conversations and church sermons and so on and so forth. I feel like oftentimes people, people make that critique. They're just not in the community to know or to listen or to care. Um, Ebony, a question for you. Um, as was mentioned before, today is a historic day. President Biden signed the law making Juneteenth a national holiday. Now, I've been following um, responses of my, my friend group on social media, and some are very happy about this historic uh, acknowledgement. Some are also a little critical and feel that it's a, it's a performative act um, that's particularly ironic at a time when there is efforts to block critical race theory being taught um, and voting rights and whatnot. Um, what are your thoughts about um, this difference of opinion about um, about today? No, absolutely. We are excited about it. We are celebrating the fact that this is passing, but we do agree that there is much work to be done. We understand that we need to get legislation passed to protect voting rights. We understand that we need to get legislation passed around policing in this country. We understand that this is something that is long overdue. This is something that should have been recognized a long time ago. But for us at the Democratic Party, this isn't um, the end all be all. We understand that we recognize and we celebrate Juneteenth, but we understand that there is still work to do. And we are still actively organizing. We are actively working. We are actively having conversations because we understand that the celebration needs to happen, but the work has to continue. So we we understand the sentiments, we feel the people's hearts and their minds, and we understand that there is so much work to do and just know that we are doing it on behalf of you all. Thank you. Um, Assembly Member Brian, um, you were an activist before being elected. You even led, led, a, uh, you even led a successful campaign in LA on issue of the big priority for um, BLM and affiliated orgs. Um, congrats and thank you for that, for, for, for leading that victory. Um, I have a question for you. Is it safe to say that you see being in office an extension of your activism? And if so, can you say more about that? You know, it, it's, it's actually funny. I've been, I've been asked this question or a variation of it three times this week where it's, <laughs> you were a community organizer and now you're an elected official. Uh, and I always remind folks, I'm still a community organizer. Right, mm -hmm. we need more community organizers in elected office. Mm -hmm. um, this is policy, um, policy making or shaping or, or uh, disrupting has always been a, a part of my priorities, right? And so just to be in a position now where I can codify that work, roll out my own bill package, vote on behalf of the 450,000 plus residents in the 54th assembly district, uh, it's an honor and it's a privilege, but I carry with me the same values the same hustle, the same drive, and the same community organizing uh, that, that got me here. I didn't get here by myself. The community came with me, and I plan on keeping that relationship during my entire tenure. Uh, and I think that it's something that we should have more elected officials aspire to do. And I know you were just, a quick follow-up, I know you were just um, confirmed recently, but um, you know, not a lot of members in the legislature have a similar background. Um, do you feel um, that you have a bigger weight on your shoulders because you are, you, you, you have been and you still are a community organizer? I think I have an advantage. Mm -hmm. I think I, I have uh, a different viewpoint and, and there's also a trail that's been blazed even in this specific uh, assembly district, right? Congresswoman Karen Bass came out of here who started as a community organizer with Community Coalition and others. So I'm not the first and, and if I do a damn good job, I definitely won't be the last. And actually, I have another follow-up question for you real quickly. Any tips that you have for any community organizers who might be listening today or watching today who might want to run for office? Yeah. Develop your inside-outside strategy. Mm. 
we're, we're, we're taught when we're organizing that, that you disrupt, you make noise, you don't engage with the system because the system wasn't built for you. And that's all very true, right? A lot of our systems are not broken. They were designed the way that they're operating. But if you want to hold office, then you have to be able to engage them. You have to be able to push them out of their comfort zones. You have to be able to dismantle them. And you have to be able to do it in a thoughtful way that builds stronger coalitions. And when you realize that you have that skill and that you're developing that skill, that's when you're ready to run. But if you still don't have relationships, have not engaged with moving policy, passing ballot measures, getting other folks into office, uh, fighting back against harmful policy and winning, uh, then, then keep on refining your roots. Keep on building up your toolkit. That way, when you're ready, the rest of us can all jump in and support you uh, because we need you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, when um, Black people like Assembly Member Bryan get into office and have a clear desire to move a set of issues that are very important to Black people, they're sometimes not supported properly. Um, what are some ways that the community can help um, him and others to be successful? Well, first and foremost, reaching out to the Black Caucus of the okay. California Democratic Party, more importantly, <laughs> organize them right where they are, right where they, um, their churches, uh, their schools, their dim clubs, uh, whatever they do in their daily life, we're at a point uh, where we have to get people to understand that organizing is, is where you're at. And that means pulling people into the fold. When you let people know that decisions are being made over their lives uh, based on policy and legislation, they'll listen to you because it changes everything. And so I really believe that consistently having the conversations, uh, churches have been involved with uh, politics for years, uh, souls to the polls, for instance. And so I believe we have to meet people where they are, get them organized, talk to talk about the issues. Um, Assembly member Brian knows he can call on me at any time and uh, the caucus would be glad uh, to assist in anything he needs done. I currently do that with all the other legislators and um, our executive board. So I believe that would be the best way to accomplish that. And a quick follow up for you. Um, can you share some of the work that the caucus has planned um, to um, to excuse me to help more um, to build more of the bench of um, oh my goodness I'm, I'm getting my nose guy I'll jump for a second sorry about that um, can you share some of the what the caucus is doing to, to ensure that the, our party is advancing justice for Black people not just supporting great candidates um, and being um, but being very active and, and, and helping to advance justice for Black people? Uh, a lot of things. For one, we're working um, side by side in coalition with the California Legislative Black Caucus and everything they're doing, bringing it down to uh, the ground level, such as the reparations. Uh, Bill Reggie Jones-Sawyer is uh, the person that sits, oh, and Senator Bradford, uh, sits on the reparations bill. I've been uh, talking with Reggie consistently on that and making sure we share that out with the members. Um, and directly, we are working on education uh, of our children. It's, it's time for somebody to stand up and really speak the facts. Dr. Weber uh, brought it to our attention, uh, the, the way that Black children are the lowest performing group, but yet they're not getting any of the funding that is out there for lowest performing groups. So black people should be enraged and we need to stand up and fight back and really start uh, talking about the issues. The caucus is doing that consistently. We're having meetings. I ask that you all come and join us sometime and listen to the conversations we're having with our members. Um, our last meeting, we had over 500 people join to, to listen in and people from all walks of life that just wanna be in coalition with us. Um, so I try to take things that are happening at the state level, bring them down to the CDP level and disseminate them out to the members. Um, we also recently opened up our committees and brought in a lot of new folks, um, people that are running for office. Some of them, we have a lady that's running for a district attorney. Uh, we have a couple of lawyers on our committee. So, um, and I'm sure they want to run someday. We, if we don't create a succession plan and uh, create a bench, then the eight black assembly members we now have will dwindle down to zero in 2024, over half of them term out. And so you ask a very relevant question, what is the black caucus of the CDP and what is the CDP 
going to do it to ensure we have a bench of black people ready to run. And can you say quickly, Taisha, how people can join the caucus? If they go to KDEM, C-A-D-E-M dot org, go to the caucuses. Uh, we are the first or second caucus listed. And you just pick your membership. You pay right there. And um, we will get an email and we'll add you to our email list and invite you to all the meetings we have coming up. Thank you. And you and Emma and Unique both put the, the, the link into the chat. Okay. So please join. Want to see a number of new members join the caucus tonight. Um, Drexel, question for you. So I believe the majority of the state's black population lives in LA County. Is that is that true or just my uh, thought I have in my head? I, I, I'm pretty sure that's true. That is very true. I, uh, we have 10 million uh, Angelinos here and uh, I think about 10% of those, and, and we'll see uh, continue to see the numbers as the new census data uh, comes out, uh, what that looks like. Uh, but definitely from the last census, uh, we were at about 10% of our population. And I know that a sizable number of the black members in the legislature and Congress are from LA County. Um, the first BLM chapter started in LA County as well. Um, how, if at all, have you seen the movement for black lives change who runs for office, how they run for office, and the treatment of Black issues? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, here in LA County alone, uh, we have nine Black state or federal representatives, uh, including uh, newly elected Senator Kamlager uh, and, and Assemblymember Bryan. Uh, and I think when it comes to um, organizations and movements getting involved in elections, uh, especially Black Lives Matter, what we've seen over the past few years um, is a couple things. Uh, one, the recruitment of candidates who are not only ready to lead, uh, but can, like Isaac, uh, reflect, articulate, and push for policy positions and motions. Uh, I say motions because people forget about city councils and, and, and other government bodies, uh, and legislation that movements and communities are demanding. Um, we saw Democratic organizations led by our young Democrats uh, saying, we're going to hold you accountable for where your money comes from, uh, whether or not it was law enforcement or somewhere else. Uh, and, and how you legislate uh, and, and, and what you're going to be doing in your term. Uh, and, and that will, uh, in turn, uh, reflect that endorsement process. Uh, and we've watched candidates update their platform uh, and their personal positions, uh, performative or not, uh, to move with the changing demands of the movement. Uh, and how we look at black issues. So uh, I think, uh, you know, I talk about Isaac a lot because he's on this panel. I think what we saw in his campaign uh, was a reflection of where we're going to go and how those campaigns are going to evolve over time. Uh, and I think that candidates are going to have to start to look at uh, the trifecta of, of running a campaign. As Isaac said, that inside out game, uh, that's gonna be so critical uh, to, um, to, to, to change. Uh, and how they can um, build their platforms around uh, movements like Black Lives Matter uh, to where they're not behind, uh, because uh, that is where we're going and, and candidates are gonna have to reflect that. And you mentioned um, young people, um, and I know you're, you're um, young and young at heart. You're also the only, the, <laughs> you're also the only Black executive director of a county party, at least in California, maybe in the country. I hope not a country, but I know in California. Um, do you feel that the party can do a better job at building a bench of Black leaders? And, and do you see any bright spots where that is happening? Um, yes. Uh, you know, and I suspect opportunities will grow as uh, county parties grow themselves and, and be able to sustain staffs. Uh, you know, Los Angeles is the largest in the nation. Uh, we have three million Democrats here. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, it, it operates like its own mini state party. Uh, and it's certainly a testament to Mark Gonzalez, who's the chair of Los Angeles, uh, who brought me in uh, at a very critical time, uh, kind of threw me into the deep end because the pandemic kind of shook some, some things up. Uh, but I know my opportunity and what I represent here in Los Angeles. Uh, for so many and, and, and the work that we have to do and the work that I am uh, being asked to do as a black uh, leader here in LA. Uh, so we absolutely can be better at building the bench of black leaders, especially young black leaders. Um, here in Los Angeles, we just launched our inaugural uh, run of our new training and advancement program focused on candidate training and recruitment. 
Uh, and while we have a strong showing of, of, of Black Angelinos in our inaugural cohort, uh, we can do better. And, and, and we're going to continue to tweak the program. Uh, and I and the team uh, absolutely will be focused on uh, how we can work with Black leaders from our elected officials to the Black Caucus, of course, uh, to our grassroots clubs here in L.A. like New Frontier, uh, Black Women's Democratic Club, uh, Black Los Angeles Young Democrats, uh, you know, who, who led by Jelani Hendricks, uh, and more where we are and should be uh, out there finding, recruiting, cultivating, and uplifting Black candidates. Uh, but that also means working with elected officials. And I know uh, Isaac brought up Congresswoman Bass, uh, working with elected officials to mentor up and coming candidates uh, to create that pipeline. Uh, and eventually knowing that it's their time, uh, just like it was when they got elected, um, uh, to, to, to pass that baton. Uh, I remember having a conversation with Isaac back in August uh, when he was thinking about running, uh, about gearing up for this run for assembly. And uh, we talked about not stepping um, on each other uh, as black leaders, but stepping with each other. Uh, and that is so critical to what we're doing because we've been trained to believe that there's only so much space for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but the only people who are gonna advocate for black candidates are black leaders and the black community uh, in, in, certain, in certain cases. So why would we spend time stepping on each other and not, and then hurting the next person down the line. Uh, that is something that we have to do better. Uh, and I know that uh, you can ask certainly uh, black leaders here, that is something that I talk about often uh, here in Los Angeles County, because there are so many great young black leaders ready to step up. Uh, and what I don't want to see certainly in this role uh, that I have the opportunity to have right now uh, is us fall behind uh, and, and, and try and end up canceling each other out because other people are going to do that uh, for us anyway. Uh, so why would we do that to each other? Uh, and so uh, what we saw in the last election was a record number of young candidates, especially young black candidates of color stepping up to run or to lead organizations that will continue to work with the party uh, to achieve our goals. Uh, so I think that's the bright spot uh, that I am looking forward to uh, over the next few years. Jack, so I feel like you might have um, you might have a, a a slogan for a new a new T-shirt. Let's step together, Democrats. <laughs> I feel I like it. So, uh, Chair Chair Brown can use that uh, with the Black Caucus. Happily uh, happy to uh, to to send that over. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Yeah, <laughs> I like the Let's step together. I'm, I, I have some visuals in mind, like some some like uh, anyhow. I, I digress. Um, you know. Um, um, Black Assembly Member Brian, I, I, I'm an organizer at heart, and I think one important part of organizing is you have to, um, you have to have a clear sense of the world you're trying to create. Um, and I actually want to start with you, Assembly Member Brian. Um, do you do you feel that we as Democrats um, have a um, a clear sense of the world that we're trying to create, especially as it pertains to Black people? I think it's becoming ever more clear every year right in every election uh, and that that vision continues to evolve and fine tune itself one of the things that's difficult is is the longer you are ingrained in in a system uh, even the party the the more you have a vested interest in the way that it all has always run right and so sometimes even the party needs a shake up and a reminder uh, to, to be radical to be transformative and to really push um, for the ideal and not just uh, the pragmatic or to remember that the ideal can become pragmatic if if we want it to be so Right, uh, but I, I'm incredibly optimistic about uh, the party here in California. I'm in even more optimistic about the County Democratic Party, uh, and I have a, a lot of hope for the country. So there's been a, a lot of great leadership, but I don't think that vision is is ever completely clear. And if it is, uh, we're not listening enough to folks on the ground uh, because our needs are dynamic and they're changing. And some have been constant for decades, some for 400 years. Uh, but as we develop new policies, as we uh, get hit with new challenges like a global pandemic, uh, more social inequities rise to the surface and it's gonna take new vision, new leadership uh, and, and a lot more new strength uh, to get us to where we need to be. Thank you. Going to the national, Ebony, I love your thoughts on that question. Um, I just want to echo what Assemblyman Brian said, that 
the needs are dynamic and they are ever changing. That's why it's important for the National Party to stay connected to our local caucuses, to our local county parties, to our people on the ground who are doing the work. Um, I will say that we are moving in the right direction. If you look at our platform that we released in 2020, it's the first time where it was said clearly that Black Lives Matter. So we are moving and we are working to do the things that need to be done. But in order to do it, we have to stay connected to the community. And I do want to emphasize a point that was mentioned earlier again by Assemblyman Brian is that we need for you all to work within the party system mm -hmm. to work and be a part of the Democratic Party. Um, one of the key things to change in the party is to be a part of it. Um, I understand it can be frustrating at times. At times you feel like you're the only person sitting at the table. Um, but your representation matters. And it starts from the local up. A lot of people think about the national parties. I used to work for the Louisiana Democratic Party. And the amount of vacancies that we would have at the local parish level on the state committee was tremendous. And these are opportunities for you to have representation within your party who raise money for Democrats, who um, endorse Democrats, who builds the organizing structure for campaigns. So we need your representation and we need for you to be a part of the party's uh, structure. So again, um, the vision isn't clear across the board because it's always changing. Our needs are changing, but that's why we are gonna stay connected to the community so we can understand the change that needs to be made on the party level so we can have a better community across the board. And, and Madam Chair, I'm going to ask you the same question, but also ask you to give any insight to people who, um, if they have um, friends um, who may feel like they they don't see them see a place for themselves inside the party, what advice would you give to them in helping to make sure the vision of the party is truly inclusive of Black people? I'm going to uh, answer the later part of the question first. Um, when I got to San Diego and got involved with the San Diego Democratic Party, I believe there was only four Blacks involved with the Central Committee. It was Dr. Weber, it was Ms. Kathleen Harmon, and one other, Eric Herford, and one other Black woman out of about 70 people. Um, and they have areas, uh, four different areas. And in my area, I was the only Black person amongst a lot of white people, but I was comfortable because I showed up, I engaged them, and I think um, it made them see things different because I would voice my opinion. So I think showing up first, you got to get comfortable with you, who you are as a Democrat. You may not always see people in the room that look like you, but if you know they have the same values, you can at least educate them on how, as Black people, where we come from. I shook San Diego up a lot, especially once I became the vice chair. And that wasn't easy. I was the first uh, Black woman vice chair of the San Diego Central Committee. And it was because I was diligent. I showed up. I brought people in. In San Diego, I was one of the first people to uh, get about 50 Black people together and tell them, run for assembly district delegates. They didn't know what it was. We had a meeting. I got them to run. And all of them won um, in different areas and districts. And to this day, they're still running. That was about four or five years ago. So showing up, being present, speaking up um, is important. If you don't show up, then you don't know what's going on or you can't be a part of the process. Uh, to your other question, um, uh, do you feel that we are, you, you asked if we feel. Do you feel that the, that the, that the, we as a party have a clear vision, a clear, a clear vision for the world we're trying to create as it pertains to black people? The nation, on the national level, I will say they're working on it. They're getting there. Since January, we've seen a lot of change. And I think with all the black um, leaders that were uh, appointed to different positions, we're definitely gonna see a lot more change over the next four years. Biden has done a wonderful job um, at appointing some wonderful uh, black people to different key positions that will definitely trickle down and, and we will all be lifted up. On the state level, I have to commend Rusty. Over the last three years, um, I've had to call him an event and they're always there to listen. They might not agree, but they will listen. And if they can make a change, they, they make that change. And that's important to me that they will listen to what I have to say. I see the change in California coming. 
I'm going to be a part of that change. I know uh, Assembly Member Bryant will definitely be shaking things up. I know that we have others uh, in the State Assembly that are going to shake things up and make sure our voices are heard. The one thing we cannot do is give up. Um, now is our moment. We have reparations on the table in the state of California and at the national level. We can't get comfortable or complacent. Uh, now's the time to really fight. Direct. So I want to um, ask you the same question with a little twist as well. Um, I think you're a visionary um, leader, and I would, and I'm, um, and I would love to, if you can share a little bit of. I know I didn't, I didn't prep you for this question, but I'd love to see, share a little bit of your vision for the um, LA County Democratic Party um, as it pertains to um, um, like building a bench of black leadership, um, kind of black issues, so on and so forth. Well, I think that's a, a really good question. Um, I, I will try to put two hats on really quickly because my role uh, uh, serves at the pleasure of the chair. Uh, and so the party's vision uh, here in LA County uh, is, is Mark Gonzalez's vision uh, for LA County. Uh, and so uh, my job is to help advise uh, him the best that I can uh, to help make the decisions to help us move forward. Uh, I think in terms of what we know is coming, um, you know, we have been since I've come in as the youngest chair, I mean, as the youngest executive director uh, with the youngest chair uh, uh, have, has been uh, squarely focused on bringing in more young voices into Los Angeles, uh, into Los Angeles County uh, Central Committee. Uh, and so that's something that we are going to be uh, focused on and working with uh, all the young leaders over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, I constantly, I'm actually in a text chain with all of the presidents of the YDs here in Los Angeles County. I constantly check on them uh, and say, what is happening in your uh, club that we can make sure that we're involved in? Uh, so the more that we're connected with uh, young uh, Democratic clubs, uh, you know, like I just mentioned, Jelani Hendricks just got elected as president of Black Los Angeles Young Democrats, and that's making sure that I am in constant contact uh, with, with, uh, with him and, and, and uplifting uh, that club as well. And, and so um, I, I think for us, that is going to be the focus because we know that is the future. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, I'm going to need, we're going to be working with Isaac uh, along the way uh, to make sure that we're continuing to do that and to continue to find uh, those candidates. Um, and I think the, you know, people kind of look at, uh, we have 300 races here in LA County uh, mm -hmm. in 2022. It, it's insane. And, and I think people start to look at the top level races, the assembly and, and, and the Senate and the Congress, and they forget that it's equally as important in the community level in, 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 in uh, city council level or water boards or any of those other races where young people can start to step up and lead in those. You want to see change at the community level, you have to be at the community level. Change does not just happen at the state at, at Sac in Sacramento. And, and, and so I think that's something else we are going to be uh, focused on over the next few years. That's why we started. Uh, you know, it was my idea to start this training and advancement program because I knew what we needed to get done here in LA County. Uh, because that is so important and is going to be so critical, or we are going to lose the future, uh, certainly as a party, uh, if we do not cultivate uh, young people uh, more in that. Uh, I think in terms of the actual question, um, I think, you know, as everyone said, uh, we, the party has been very clear and ever-changing on what our positions have been, uh, and it will continue to be. Uh, I think right now, as, uh, as Ebony said earlier, right now we have Chair Harrison at the top, we have Vice Chair Lance, uh, Lance Bottoms uh, right underneath as a Vice Chair. Uh, so there is a, a pipeline of leadership uh, at the DNC level that's going to make sure uh, that we do that. Uh, of course, from the top, we've got Vice President Harris. Uh, and so we are, have, we are at a, in an opportunity right now uh, where, as uh, everyone has said, if we step up and show up, uh, mm -hmm. then we are leading uh, the future. <laughs> and we can only do, I can tell you, I mean, if I did not show up, four or five years ago in LA County, I mean, I've been here for a few years, uh, and put myself in those rooms that I needed to be in, I would not be in this job right now. Uh, and so, you know, and I did not expect this job. It did, you know, it kind of came out of nowhere. But my, my point is, is that it is a testament to showing up, doing the work, head down, showing that you can do what you need to get done. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, you're helping, now we're helping lead the largest, uh, a county party in the nation. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna continue to do. Uh, so like I said, my vision uh, is to help people 
uh, and to serve at the pleasure of the chair. And that's what I'm, I'm going to do as long as I'm here. All right. A question from the audience from Tiffany Grimsley. Running for office is very different from serving in public office. What advice do you have for first time elected black officials in local government? How can we best serve the African-American community, the Democratic Party, and local communities? That's to, to anyone, any one of you. I'll take, I'll take the first swing and it's uh, govern the way that you ran, the values you ran on, the things that you stood for, the things that separated you from others who were running for that seat. Those are the things that the community voted in, right? Those are the policy priorities that the community is expecting you to deliver on. And so stay rooted, stay yourself. You don't have to change from campaign to elected official if you campaigned on the same values that you were moving on before you ran for office and then you govern with those values as well. So I would do my best and encourage others to just stay as rooted as possible. Stay true to yourself, stay true to the community uh, and trust that voters have your back uh, as long as you do that. Anyone else want to chime in? I will just kind of echo what, what, what the assembly member said, which uh, is to be unapologetically yourself in spaces uh, that, that matter. Uh, you know, I know how I am. I'm very comfortable in knowing who I am uh, in this role. Uh, you, it's either love or hate. Uh, and I am unapologetic about that because I have one job and that is to protect the party. Uh, and that is to do the work on behalf of Angelina is here. Uh, and if you're in the way of that, then that is a problem for me. And, and, and so what we have to do uh, is make sure you, like Isaac said, you know exactly what you, uh, your goal is and, and what you're gonna get done uh, and, and, and keep your head down and do the work uh, because that's all anybody expects us to do. Uh, you know, constituents expect uh, deliverables. Uh, the party members expect deliverables. Caucus members expect deliverables. DNC members expect deliverables. If you cannot deliver, uh, then you might not be the one to lead. And, uh, and so I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, we certainly, uh, certainly everyone on this panel uh, ha has uh, continues to do what we have to do uh, to make sure that that is something uh, that is a priority. And last question for all of you. Um, how are you going to be celebrating Juneteenth on Saturday? How about um, starting with you, Ebony? Well, I'm really excited in the other room. I have my older sister <laughs> and my niece and one of her friends. We're actually getting together and having a community celebration, socially distanced with a limited amount of people um, and within our trusted pod. We're coming together. We're celebrating this moment, but also commemorating um, my friend circle here in DC is amazing in our historical roots. Like I have friends who are connected to Tulsa and Black Wall Street. Um, mm -hmm. We come from political backgrounds and me coming from Louisiana and being so close to Texas, um, just having that moment to reflect and commemorate, but also to organize. So even though we are coming together to celebrate, we're always thinking, we're always organizing and think about, thinking about ways so we can benefit our community. So I'm really excited about celebrating with my family, really excited my sister and my niece is here from Louisiana and they actually um, went to the African-American Museum today oh, yeah. and was able to go for the very first time. So that's the way I'm celebrating with my family, with my friends, but also thinking about ways we can organize. And how can people get in touch with you or, or, uh, or support what you're working on if they want to do so? So absolutely. So you can all uh, send an email over to coalitionsd at dnc.org. And then also um, just follow up. Like if there's something really particular and specific, just reach out to Vincent and I'll follow up um, personally. Also, you can follow me on, um, I'm on Twitter, Ebony M. Baylor. And on Instagram, same name, Ebony M. Baylor, um, just to get updates and things that we're doing at the party. Thank you. Um, Isaac, how are you celebrating tomorrow on Saturday? I'm going to be in the Merck Park. All right. <laughs> you know, in, in probably Culver City and, and probably somewhere else as well. There's, there's a lot happening in the district. I know uh, Friday I will be with Supervisor Holly Mitchell at Magic Johnson uh, Park celebrating as well. So June, Juneteenth, I'm celebrating all weekend, not just on Saturday. <laughs> right? I might celebrate a couple of days after that. Um, but really just showing love uh, and, and reflecting on the journey that we've had, but, but all the work yet still to be done. 
And a lot of people are getting to know you for the first time tonight. How can they um, find you and support you? Yeah, uh, I'm active on social media. Uh, at IB2Real, I don't have a uh, an intern who runs my social media. There's no consultant. It's, it's actually me, um, which is, is good or bad. Uh, you can decide when you, when you start following. But um, I, I share what I'm thinking. I share what I care about. And I engage with folks. So if you'd like to to learn more about what we're doing in the 54th, you can definitely get at me there. But also the Capitol is starting to open up. We're lifting restrictions. So if you find yourself in Sacramento, uh, come to the second floor, office 2137. Pop in, see me, let's have a conversation uh, and let's keep pushing together. And one more quick question. What's in the picture behind you? That's Jimi Hendrix. But oh. y'all, are, y'all are lucky because I have a, a six and a half foot Tupac <laughs> over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nips, Nipsey's over there and Kobe's over there. So I just know <laughs> Jimi Hendrix more. Okay. Um, Drexo, how are you celebrating Juneteenth this weekend? Well, I, Isaac knows where all the parties are at here in LA. So I, whatever, wherever Isaac goes, I think I'm going to have to show up then. Um, you know, I, like, like Isaac said, uh, Supervisor Mitchell has uh, an event on Friday uh, that uh, I will likely be at. And uh, of course, I still have to work on Friday. We've got some recalls uh, attempts happening here in Los Angeles County, uh, one against our uh, sitting a district attorney. Uh, mm-hmm. So we're going to be out there with SEIU 2015 on Friday, uh, mm-hmm. making sure that folks know uh, that uh, this is not going to happen here in our county. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're going to do that. I think on Saturday, we have a friend, uh, a, a, a young uh, a Black brother who is uh, headed off to D.C. Uh, we will uh, see him off on Saturday uh, as he heads uh, to the Department of Homeland Security. So very proud of him. So uh, I see Isaac shaking his head because he's probably going to be there as well. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I think we're going we're, we're gonna to do that uh, uh, that that's going to be my weekend. And how can people find you or be able to support the, what you're doing at the party? Uh, you can follow me on all platforms at, at Drexel Heard. Uh, I too am active on Twitter. Uh, Isaac, who just got verified on Twitter, by the way, I just saw the other day. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm always following Isaac and, and everything that's happening there. So uh, at Drexel Heard, uh, or just email me, or if you're in LA County, uh, pop into the LA County uh, office here. Uh, downtown LA, and uh, we'll, we'll definitely say hello. All right. Taisha, um, how about a um, question for you? How are you celebrating? I uh, was invited to speak at four different events, but I think I'm going to join uh, Assemblyman uh, Bryant and Drexel <laughs> at Holly's event <laughs> in LA. No, I have uh, four different events I'm speaking at um, uh, between tomorrow evening and, and Saturday. And I'm glad things are opening up. I'm still going to wear my mask um, and I'm excited. Uh, We have a lot to celebrate. And I think um, after having this conversation with all these great panelists, uh, we have a reason to uh, really, really celebrate and and engage our people and have a wonderful uh, weekend celebrating uh, Juneteenth. And before we close, I just want to make... I want to um, say quick, one more thing. I go for it. No for it. Go Please for it. Please go to uh, uh, CA, I'm sorry, what is it? CD, CDP Black Caucus um, at Facebook, CDP Black Caucus on Twitter, and CDPBlackCaucus.org is our website. Um, CADEM.org is the CDP's website where you could join the caucus. Um, Come check us out and see what we're doing. we got a lot of great stuff happening. We're going to have the assembly member on soon. Um, He promised. So don't know the date yet, but it's coming. And I'm at another website, stoptherecall.com. 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 Stoptherepublicanrecall.com. Thank you. Thank you. Stoptherepublicanrecall.com. Excuse me. Stoptherepublicanrecall.com. Because the anti-recall campaign is moving full speed ahead. Please visit that link. It's in the chat right now to show your support for Governor Newsom at StopTheRepublicanRecall.com. You can sign a petition as well as sign up to volunteer and donate. The California Democratic Party Department of Organizing has lots of opportunities for you to join us in this fight um, for California against the recall. So please get engaged by staying tuned to emails and from Kadem and sign up for events on the Kadem Mobilize America page. 
Um, and lastly, let's give a big round of applause for Assembly Member Isaac Bryan, Madam Chair Taisha Brown, um, Ebony Baylor with the DNC, and Drexel Hurd. Thank you all, and happy Juneteenth.